a Lifetime original podcast. This episode covers topics that include murder and violence. Listener discretion is advised. In the June 1976 issue of Esquire magazine, writer Mark Goodman details what would likely be the final interview of a high society legend. In the article, titled The Further Misadventures of Candy, he describes how a cocktail party at a Houston mansion stops suddenly at 1 a.m. The rock band that had been blasting calms to a simmer of drums. The lights dim and all eyes turn to the hall staircase where a spotlight beams through the haze of cigarette smoke to illuminate a beautiful blonde woman descending into the crowd. A voice calls out over the microphone. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Mrs. Candace Mossler, and the applause erupts. Mark Goodman interviews Candace until the sun rises. She's a creature of social intrigue and suspicion, especially when it comes to the circumstances of her husband's untimely murder. When he asks about the murder, she claims that Miami police tied her up and tried to torture a false confession out of her. But she never gave in, she said. Her husband's death was just a tragic mystery. Never mind that her late husband's penthouse door was left unlocked that night. Or that Candace's lover was spotted fleeing the scene. Or that she stood to inherit a multi-million dollar fortune in the event of his death. As Candace would tell Esquire, we have our sorrows and our heartaches, but you have to put that bridge behind you. It helps when you're crossing that bridge to get to a mansion and incomparable wealth. The story of Candace Mosler doesn't begin anywhere fancy, not in the halls of the Ritz-Carlton or on a private jet. She actually starts out pretty scrappy. She's born Candace Weatherby in Buchanan, Georgia in 1920, and she is the sixth of, get ready for it, 12 children. Whoa. I know. Whoa. Her parents are farmers, and maybe it's boring. I know they don't have a TV. They don't have a telephone. They don't have a radio. Not much to do, but yeah, make but, babies. Well, they do need the extra help on the farm. Mm. Because Candace spends her days working. She works in the fields. She plants crops. She picks cottons, and she takes care of their chickens. Now, this is a far cry from what I would see as the cultural image of the Roaring Twenties. You know, it's like less parties, more work, less booze, more chickens. Listen, it doesn't sound like it's totally my speed, but I got to tell you, sadly, things are about to get much worse. Right. When Candace is 12, her mom, Lizzie Weatherby, is due to have her 13th child, Whew. and it is not lucky 13. When she goes into labor, this is like nothing she has ever experienced and she knows what it's like to have kids she's had 12 kids and That's this right. 13th is like oh my god something is wrong well Oof. her new sibling doesn't survive and neither oh. does candace's mother and this woman who spent her whole adult life pregnant then dies trying to bring this baby into the world her death sends Candace's dad into a total tailspin. He just starts drinking and drinking, going on just an alcohol-fueled bender. Specifically, I guess he liked corn whiskey, which feels somehow right for a farmer. Um, what feels wrong is that he then abandons these 12 children and the farm. So Candace and her siblings are separated amongst their relatives. And though she's only a kid, she's told early on that her life is limited to being a wife and a mother. So she resolves to lift herself up with the only tool she has, marriage. So when Candace turns 19 in 1939, she gets married to Norman Johnson, a civil engineer in Anniston, Alabama. And a year later, they have their first child, Norman Jr., and it's also 1939, and everyone but Quinn knows what's about to happen. Fantasia. Right. So World War II. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Close. Candace, along with a lot of the women at the time, spend their days volunteering for the war effort. She works with military support groups, and she hosts parties for soldiers at Fort Benning in Georgia. And at one party, she actually meets this guy, Winthrop Rockefeller. Have you heard of it? I have. As in the Rockefeller, heir to Standard Oil fortune. 
And he's mesmerized by her bright blue eyes and her two big boobs. And the two, <laughs> they grow very close in a very short amount of time they have together before he's shipped off to war. And they grow so close, in fact, that Candace names her second child after him, Rita Rockefeller Johnson. No relation? Hmm. They, they must have been very good friends. I would love to be in the delivery room with her husband being like, I'd like to name my daughter middle name after this guy I met. Very confusing. Mm-hmm. Lots of, I'm very confused. Well, this is the first time that Candace sort of realizes that her charm captures people's hearts. And some of these people are rich. Some of these people are quite powerful. And she doesn't feel she was necessarily born to live in the rural South and reenact the same family dysfunction that she grew up in. Uh, She just has higher aspirations than that. She's got high in the sky apple galette hopes. (laughs) So when her husband Norman gets a job in New Orleans, she's thrilled that she's finally moving to a big city, a place where she can finally make a name for herself. And she acclimates to this city pretty quickly. And it's not long after arriving that she and Norman split. He abandons her and their two children, and he, and he leaves her to raise the kids on her own. I mean, listen, after that middle name nod to another man, I'm not that surprised. <laughs> Accurate. Candace takes this breakup pretty well, but, you know, suddenly she is on her own scraping by to support these two kids. So she has to get a job. She gets a job selling lingerie and modeling clothes in department stores, and she realizes, hey, I'm pretty good at this. So she goes to New York to take classes at the Barbizon School of Modeling, where you can train to be a model or just look like one. Carrie, are you too young to have seen those commercials? No, I remember these commercials, the Barbizon girls. And they'd end with, if you're 13 or over, call for your Barbizon booklet today. Did you ever call? Of course. I didn't. My self-doubt I, it cost was money, very... So I, was, I think I was 13 when I called, and when I found out it cost money, I hung up. Fair. So it's in the mid-40s, and Candace is teaching her own classes at this newly formed Candace Modeling and Self-Improvement School, where all the graduates are guaranteed to become a real person of distinction. And just to give you an idea of what people are paying for in this class... She teaches a class on how to wear a hat properly. Listen, (laughs) she's an entrepreneur, and frankly, hats are hard. I I could use the class. As highfalutin as it sounds, Candace isn't just a teacher or an expert hat wearer. Uh, Rumor has it she's actually kind of a pimp. I, I guess in this case, you'd say she's a madam. Listen, she's an entrepreneur, and men are hard. (laughs) She publicizes dance lessons at her house, and she would pair up returning soldiers with women that worked for her. And I guess, you know, they dance together, and then maybe, I don't know, they got extra sleepy because the foxtrot can really take a lot out of you, and they'd retire to a bedroom. And the soldiers could pay for the dance lessons with their GI benefits. But she didn't let these rumors sully her reputation. By 1947, Candace is well known around town in New Orleans circles as a distinguished member of society. In fact, she still volunteers regularly. And one of her pet projects that she's working on is for the NOLA Opera. And she solicits donations from local organizations and business people. And so one of the men who she hopes to sort of charm a donation out of is this wealthy banker named Jacques Mossler. He's 25 years older than she is. And to be honest, he's really not interested in the opera. What he is interested in is Candace. She really catches his eye and and he decides to donate a whole $25. Wow. Listen, I never <laughs> said he was generous. Um But I guess that's what she was worth in his eyes for a donation. I don't know. But they part ways after this donation is made. 
A few weeks later, Candace takes her kids on a trip to the Audubon Zoo and runs into Jacques again. He's he cute. Yeah, I got to tell you guys, this is an average looking guy. He's a Romanian immigrant and a World War One veteran. And he made all his money by turning a successful car dealership into just a business empire. But after this meeting at the zoo, they start to date. And by 1949, they get married in a Presbyterian church in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, making Candace Johnson Candace Mosler. Jacques loves his new wife, and Candace loves her new life. He moves her and her kids into a three-story red brick mansion in Houston, Texas. It has a pool, luxury cars, I mean, he is a car salesman, and an array of servants to tend to her every need and wish. She has maids, she has cooks, she has butlers, gardeners, handymen, and chauffeurs. Oh, my. But Candace doesn't stop doing her volunteering work. She joins her local Presbyterian church. She volunteers at the hospital. She donates money to causes of all sorts. The theater, the Houston Boys Club, heart disease research, and of course, the opera, where she works as the chair of the fund drive. Ooh. She gives them another $25, I'll bet. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so generous. The <laughs> gifts just keep coming. So she also throws extravagant parties at her Houston mansion to raise money. I don't know why, but I just get like Great Gatsby vibes. Mm -hmm. She just like loves to throw a bash. And she would glide from room to room and schmooze and flirt with potential donors. Somehow, this poor daughter of a Georgia farmer fits in amongst the wealthy opera goers with ease. It's like she was born for this. Mm -hmm. As one fellow socialite put it, all she had to do was touch an older gentleman on the arm and say, I really love your tie. And you could just watch him melt. I envy this power. <laughs> well, get your booklet today at Barbizon. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, her husband keeps a pretty low profile. He's still just working on growing this fortune with investments in oil and banks, stuff rich people like. And in one case, a life insurance company. And over the next eight years of marriage, the Mosler fortune just grows and grows and grows as he travels around the country building this empire. Just, he's one of those rich guys getting richer every day. And on a business trip to Chicago around Christmas time, Jacques reads this story in a newspaper about four recently orphaned children. Okay, it's a very sad story. The children's father, Leonard Glenn, in a psychotic break, murdered their mother and youngest brother in front of them. Their father was immediately captured and committed to a high security hospital soon after this incident. But when Jacques is reading this story, it is just tugging at his heartstrings. The oldest of the children is only six years old and the youngest is two. So he calls up Candace and he asks the question, hey, what if we could adopt these kids? And she loves the idea. So she hops on the first plane to Chicago to meet Jacques and sign the paperwork. And by February, the Mosslers are bringing home four kids, Martha, Daniel, Christopher, and Edward, to live with them in their Houston mansion. It's got like these little orphan Annie vibes to me of this very rich family bringing in these kids into this home that they could only have ever dreamed of living in. And as they get off the plane, there are photographers waiting for them. And in the Springfield Leader and Press in July of 1957, they are smiling ear to ear as they get off the plane with these four young kids. Candace is beaming in a black button-down dress, and Jacques is grinning behind these round sunglasses. And these kids are smiling, which is so hopeful because they've just experienced the worst possible incident ever. Mm -hmm. And there's pictures of the kids lounging by the pool and playing on the winding mansion staircase. And they meet their new siblings, Norman and Rita, who are teenagers now. And the newspaper applauds the Mosslers for their generosity. First, they collectively gave like $50 to the opera. And now this? <laughs> Just incredible. It's really just the generosity just keeps growing and growing and growing. But I, there is a moment that it does give me pause where when you see these photographs in the newspaper, you're like, is this a publicity stunt? 
you know, mm. like it's a, doing a good deed is one thing and then go, doing a good deed and then having it splashed across the front page feels a little bit like another. Well, they're socialites and it is a good story. That's true. The Moslers have never been happier or more successful. And maybe because of all of these stories of their philanthropy, in 1961, Candace gets a call from her older sister, and she calls Candace asking for some help with her son. Candace's 20-year-old nephew, Melvin Mel Powers, is in need of some help. He's kind of gotten to some hot water, and he's fresh out of prison on a fraud charge. After a 90-day sentence, he needs a new, fresh start. Now, Candace has never met Mel before, but he's family and she has a history of taking people in. So maybe she can convince Jacques to give him a job. And, you know, honestly, I think Mel would take anything at this point. Yeah, well, especially if anything is this red brick mansion. And he shows up there and Candace welcomes him with open arms. And he actually looks like a movie star handsome he's tall yeah he's broad he's got this dark hair and she's like here's your room oh and you probably need to get around here's a thunderbird sports car too and Jacques's like also here's a job as a repossessor at one of his loan firms so he's essentially going to be the muscle for a loan shark operation basically a repo man and as it turns out Mel's pretty good at it. I guess yeah. like 90 days in jail and a fraud charge is like a prerequisite for that kind of work. And, you know, he moves up to the ranks at the firm. And after about two years, he's a completely changed man, both inside and out. Hmm. And I'm not I'm not kidding here. Candace actually pays for him to have some cosmetic surgery. They, Whoa. It's... <laughs> It's a move, you know? I, I, I got gifts from my aunts. I never got a, a nose job or anything. No, um, they pin his ears back. They sand down the sides of his face to hide his acne scars. And they even get him circumcised. <laughs> Just a little <laughs> off the top and a little off the bottom. Um, <laughs> so Mel and his Aunt Candace are getting along really, really well. And they grow closer and closer. And then suddenly, in 1963, things just flip upside down. What Candace publicly tells people is that Mel decided to leave his job at the firm to start his own business. But we know that's not really the full story because internally what actually happened is he was fired and we know he wasn't doing a bad job. He was doing a great job. But Jacques personally said, You've got to leave. And it was sudden and it was angry. They're known for their generosity and for being family people. So why did Jacques ask Mel to leave and in a hurry? What is going on? It's a year later and Mel is out on his own and he's actually doing pretty well himself. And Candace is still with her kids and her husband and her family and they're still living the life of Riley. And it's June of 1964 and Jacques has to go to Miami for business. And Candace uses this as an opportunity to make a little vacation for her and her family. So they tag along on this business trip. The Mosslers have an oceanfront apartment on Key Biscayne and it's a short drive just outside of Miami. And it's a quiet little beach community, and it's the perfect place to unwind, play at the beach, enjoy the Florida sun, you know, with the kids. It has, I mean, it's Florida, so I guess that's not saying a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just what she and her kids are doing, having a nice day at the beach on June 29th, some fun in the sun. They go run a few errands with their mom after, and she treats them to some burgers, and then she feels a headache coming on. She's got chronic migraines. She can tell this one is going to be a really bad one. So after they ate these burgers, she and the kids go over to the hospital so she can get treatment for it. And I guess the line at the hospital is quite long because it isn't until 1.20 a.m. that she's able to get her injection. And the kids are unfazed. They're used to this kind of stuff. Um, this is actually the fourth time they've gone with their mom to the hospital this vacation. They return to the apartment at 4.30 a.m., the sun hasn't even come up, but it's very close to morning. And when they walk in the door, they don't immediately notice this, but Jacques is wrapped in an orange blanket on the hardwood floor. Candace's eldest daughter, 20-year-old Rita Rockefeller, is the first one to go check on him. 
and she lifts this blanket and is horrified. She finds a gruesome scene underneath. She finds Jacques covered in blood. His head has been bludgeoned, and there are dozens of stab wounds all over his body. Rita yells to her mother, stay back, go away, don't come near. But Candace can't stay away. That's her husband. She has to see what's happened. And when she goes to look under the blanket, she realizes Jacques is dead. And behind her are these four orphan kids who have just lost another parent to murder. Their worst memories come back to life. The police come to investigate the crime scene, and Candace is beside herself. Her husband was just murdered. And she notices that her watch, a diamond ring, a golden brooch, and $200 are missing from the apartment. Jacques has been stabbed 39 times. His pants are on the ground nearby, which presumably the perpetrator searched them for valuables after the fact. Officers spread out along the hall asking the neighbors if they heard anything that night. And actually, it turns out there were quite a few tips. One report is that around 2 o'clock in the morning, the Mossler's dog is barking on the balcony, but then the barking suddenly just stopped. And then soon after, a neighbor heard a voice say, don't do that to me, it's you, implying that Jacques recognized the killer. And the owner of the apartment complex says that he saw a man fleeing the scene in a 59 Chevrolet. Candace is trying to help the police as best as she can to figure this out. Obviously, as the spouse, she'd be the first suspect, but her alibi is ironclad. She was at the hospital with the migraine, and her kids were all with her. She thinks that the person who did this had to have been an enemy of Jacques, and she tells the police, to be honest, there's no shortage of men who would want him dead because you just don't make it this far in business without stepping on a few toes. But then Candace hints that it could have been a spurned lover. She tells the cops that Jacques has had affairs and sexual exploits with other men. Wow, that's a hell of a lead. And it's definitely something to go on. But before they can really sink their teeth into this, an even more salacious story comes into focus. Because the Miami police catch wind of the sudden departure of Melvin Powers from the Mossler estate a year earlier. As they understand it, Melvin was fired from his job at Jock's company and then escorted off the property, and nobody knows why that happened. But after a bit more digging, the investigators discover that a staffer at the mansion caught Melvin in an intimate embrace with his Aunt Candace. As it turns out, Melvin also happened to buy a plane ticket to Miami on June 29th, the afternoon before the murder. And he was seen driving a 1960 Chevrolet to a bar near Key Biscayne, asking at the bar for an empty Coke bottle, which police believe to be the murder weapon because who orders that? And then the next morning, he bought a plane ticket back to Houston. And Melvin's palm prints are found all over the scene of the crime. But because he knew then there was a reason he would be at the apartment, they can't totally place his prints there the night in question. According to the Miami Herald, the Houston PD arrests Melvin on trumped-up charges related to traffic violations, but really what they're doing is trying to bring him back to the police station for an interrogation. And the Miami police fly into town and grill him all day. He denies everything. He claims to have been at a movie in Houston the night of the murder, but he can't seem to remember which one. (laughs) Jesus, Mel, take an improv class, man. Just like a hot tip. If you're going to do a murder, like make sure you know what movie you say you saw. That is the dumbest. I can't with that. I honestly can't. But then the police search Mel's trailer, and they discover photos of Mel and Aunt Candace sitting close together at a nightclub and holding hands at a resort. And then the most damning evidence, I think, is they find letters from Candace. One reads like a Harlequin note. Rom- one reads like a Harlequin romance novel. It says, "My darling, the image of your face is before me. I can almost feel your face against mine." I could not think of life without you. I love you. 
I need you. I long for you. Which, if you've watched Bridgerton, we know what that means. Yeah. I'm also like, Mel, uh, you're really exceptionally bad at this. First, there's the uh, cover-up with the movie story. But then you didn't ditch the flowers in the attic paraphernalia? Ugh. Altogether, this evidence places Melvin near the scene of the crime and gives him a clear motive for committing it. That same day they discover this, just five days after Jacques Mossler was found dead, Melvin Powers is charged with murder. Meanwhile, Candace Mossler is holed up in a hospital suffering from what doctors call a nervous strain. Perhaps it's sort of like a, I don't know, modern day hysteria Her husband's death, her lover's arrest, it's it's a lot. It's too much for her. Yeah, but it's not too much where she won't allow the press in. Because the press comes by to ask her just a couple of questions. You know, there's no such thing as bad press. So you see her. She's sitting in a hospital bed. She's surrounded by a pink nightgown. And her eyes are puffy, you know, from the tears. Um, And so the press asks about her romantic relationship with her nephew. And she replies... Well, no, I called everyone darling because that's just what I did. You know, you're a darling, you're a darling, everyone's a darling. Yeah, the idea that good old Melvin would kill Jacques. Oh, poo, she tells them. That's the most ridiculous thing she's ever heard. Mel was devoted to Jacques. He helped nurse Jacques back to health when he was sick, and he was being mentored by him. Their falling out was nothing more than a young man spreading his wings to fly. Then the press turns to her and they ask her if she's worried about being indicted for her husband's murder as an accomplice of sorts. And she says, how can something like this happen in this country? I don't know how they can do this. I guess some people could cast reflections on Jesus Christ himself. Wow, Candace, coming in hot with the Christ comparisons. How dare the press and the police crucify her? She isn't worthy of such scrutiny. Poor Candace. Woe is Candace. Don't worry. Candace doesn't have to endure this grave injustice without some monetary compensation. In Jacques' will, he ends up making Candace the sole executrix and trustee of the estate. Now, I just had to do a quick pause button here and talk about the word executrix. I had never heard of this Mm -mm. word before. Very weird. Very, like, oh, like sexual almost. It's strange. It's it's a hot name. And I think it's the female version of executor. And I'm not typically into the, like, you know, actress, actor, like, you know, gendered sort of difference. But I got to be honest with you. I would for sure be okay if someone called me an executrix. Hmm. I'm just saying. Noted. So Jacques makes her the executrix, and he leaves her an astounding $15 million at least. She is risen. Amen. Behind the scenes, investigators are finding all of this pretty suspect. As they're mounting this case against Melvin, it becomes clear to them that Candace's fingerprints are just all over this, and the motive is plain. She believed that her husband was cheating on her with several young men. She told them that herself. But more importantly, or at least more damningly, she was having her own affair with a young man. And the guy is her nephew. And he's suspected of killing her husband. And Candace stood to inherit everything in the event of Jacques' death, but only if he didn't write her out of the will before Melvin did the deed. So time was of the essence. Now, there were some attempts to change Candace's inheritance after Mel was kicked out, leaving us to wonder, what did Jacques know? So there was a second will, one that significantly decreased Candace's control over the Mosler fortune. And Jacques had it drafted, but he never signed it. It was only a few days before the murder that the will was updated, reinstating Candace's role as the sole executrix and trustee. Professional opinion here, that does sound super duper fishy. Whether Jacques was coerced or persuaded by Candace, we don't know. But the facts do suggest that something more was going on behind the scenes. And in July of 1965, the investigators present their evidence to a grand jury. And upon reviewing the facts, Melvin Powers is indicted for murder along with his accomplice, Aunt Candace Mosler. And she's, of course, shocked. 
Her characteristic charm and her sweetness turns pretty sour and she starts going on the offensive. She calls up Jean Miller, a reporter with the Miami Herald, and starts railing at the prosecutor. She says, they're trying to get their filthy, greedy, grimy hands on my banks in Miami. She insists she's being framed. She says, it is nothing more than politics, strictly politics. They have twisted everything. I am shocked. I can't tell you how much. And then she accuses the grand jury that indicted her of blackmail. They want to get rid of me so they can take over the 18 million, I guess, in my banks in Miami. It's no more than highway robbery. I really admire Jesse James. He used a gun. Now, Candace, I think you're referencing the infamous train robber and murderer played by Hot Brad Pitt in a movie constitutes a threat but also more practically how can a jury do a blackmail like i'm no criminal justice expert and i mean i just play one on a podcast but grand juries don't become next of kin in the event of a guilty verdict like that would be absolute chaos like how does a jury do blackmail <laughs> candace's fate is tied to her lover oh i'm sorry uh i mean her nephew <laughs> she and melvin have to prepare for what is sure to be a vicious and public trial where the prosecutors are going to throw accusations from which Candace, the socialite, will never escape. And lucky for them, they got money. And their lawyer is a heavyweight worth every penny. 63-year-old Percy Foreman is 6'5 and burly. He's kind of the guy you'd picture in a cage fight against a bear in the era of <laughs> Theodore Roosevelt. Whoa. <laughs> Hot. Mm. In his career, he's won at least 300 acquittals for accused murderers. And he's known to give long sermons full of colorful language and persuasive imagery. He's like the preacher of the accused. And this trial is the O.J. Simpson trial of its time. Forty journalists from all over the country come to watch. The New York Daily News writes, Candy's adopted four live again in the shadow of violent death. Time magazine calls Candace lysome and lippy. I think that's code for pretty and mean. <laughs> Something I would actually use to describe you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> The Chicago Tribune reports that the trial is lubricated by sex, nourished by sex, and varnished with sex. I think we could all agree it was quite titillating. Is that another joke about her boobs? Yes, it is. <laughs> but it's not just the journalists. Hundreds of Miamians flock to the courthouse, <laughs> and only those 21 and older are allowed in. It's like this R-rated blockbuster movie. When you and couldn't seats... get... When you couldn't get porn on the web, you had to go to a court to get it, I guess. Well, it's incest porn. I mean, <laughs> it's pretty racy. Seats in the courtroom are so desirable, in fact, that people bring their lunches in bags so that they won't have to risk losing their spot during recess. They're like, listen, hook up the catheter. This is going to be good. And they are watching the Battle of Giants, literally, because standing against Attorney Percy Foreman is prosecutor Richard Gerstein, a 6'5", same height, former Air Force bomber who lost his right eye in World War II. And while he doesn't have the same oratory skills as Foreman, he is the bear in that metaphorical cage. It's a cage match. The prosecution story is simple. Candace and Melvin plotted against Jacques so that they could take his fortune and live out their perverse relationship. And, though Melvin did the dirty work, it was Aunt Candace whose temptress powers of persuasion bewitched him into killing Jacques out of love for her. She said, kill my husband, and he said, well, if you incest... The state calls several witnesses to testify that Candace approached them about assassinating her husband, and she offered them money in exchange for their deeds, but none of them took up the offer. And other witnesses come forward to say that Melvin hated Jock, and he knew what he was doing. He's no dope, and his relationship with Candace was a tool to get what he wanted. He bragged to one witness that all he had to do was give her oral sex. And then the prosecution pulls out a copy of Jacques' diary, and he reads an excerpt which states in no uncertain terms, 
quote, if Mel and Candace don't kill me first, I'll have to kill them. Note to self, keep a diary. Yeah, it's all pretty Shakespearean. Jacques knew that he was in danger, and he knew that Candace and Melvin were out to get him and his fortune. And ultimately, even though he knew that, they succeeded. And they'll continue to succeed if the jury doesn't find them guilty. So now it's defense attorney Percy Foreman's turn at the lectern, and he doesn't pull any punches. He says, Gersten has subpoenaed some 224 witnesses, but except for the cops, it seemed to some observers that most of those so-called to testify against Candy and Mel were an unreliable clutch of criminals, drug addicts, and nitwits. Essentially, he's saying none of the prosecution's witnesses are worthy of the jury's trust. They just want the spotlight or to make a deal, and the state's case is, at best, circumstantial. The Coke bottle that they accuse Melvin of bludgeoning Jacques with was never found, nor was the long-bladed knife used in the stabbing. Evidence that Melvin's fingerprints were at the crime scene cannot be time-dated, so they're useless. You don't have a weapon, and you can't put him there. Jacques, on the other hand, is a man with a lot of enemies. As Percy Foreman puts it, Jacques was as ruthless in business as any pirate who ever sailed the seven seas, a man who received so many threats against his life that he kept an axe beside his bed and frequently summoned thugs and gangsters to his home, employing them to deal with blackmailers. They also argue that he was a sexual sadist who'd had every conceivable sex deviation that anybody's ever had and an insatiable sex appetite for young men, very young men. And frankly, it does sound like he and Candace had some hobbies in common. But on a personal note, I also just want to say I don't love the sex deviation accusation. Like, let's not yuck anybody else's yum unless the yum is murder. Yeah, the homophobia in this case is incredibly rampant. And it is accused by the defense attorney that Jacques employed several fancy-talking young men who made much more money than they should have been making. And no doubt Jacques made some enemies amongst them, too. While Foreman makes this case to the jury, Candace is working the press. And Candace is dressed perfectly. She's in tailored clothes and she puts on an all-American smile and she plays the part of a sweet and delicate little angel whose children surround her like she were the center of their world. And another thing, her ailments cause several delays. Headaches, stomach issues, you name it. And at one point she even shows up to the trial with a neck brace on. Whether it's an act or not, it earns her lots of sympathy points from the all-male jury. How she got an all-male jury? That's really beyond me. Kudos to the defense for that move. Percy Foreman, you are earning that paycheck. Well, I can't give him all the credit, Quinn, because it's also the 1960s, and frankly, they still don't trust women. Ah, okay. Well, before he gets his check, let's, uh, let's hear his closing argument. He stands before the court. And in my favorite quote from the trial, Foreman says, I will now make a few brief remarks. And then he proceeds to speak for five hours with three intermissions. Don't worry, we all got to pee, um, which, by the way, is four times longer than the prosecution spoke. Yeah, he's practically sermonizing the jury. He invokes quotes from Buddha, Shakespeare and Candace's twin, Jesus Christ. <laughs> the defense argues that all this talk about who's hugging and who's kissing, it's all relative. <laughs> No, he didn't use that phrase. I wish he did. I wish he did. He just says that it's a distraction from the real question. Did Melvin and Candace commit murder without a reasonable doubt? The trial lasts from January to March of 1966. And when the jury finally goes into deliberation, they're there for three days. A quarter after noon on March 6th, the jury returns to the courtroom with their verdict. Melvin Powers and Candace Mosler, on the count of murder in the first degree, are found not guilty. A sigh of relief is audible from aunt, nephew, lovers. Melvin leans back in his chair and says, beautiful. Candace bursts into tears of joy and relief. She hugs and kisses anyone who will take it. Her children, 
Melvin, her lawyer, and every one of the 12 jurors. The New York Daily News headline reads, free, it's candy kisses all around. You know, it makes you really wonder what she promised those jurors. The kisses to ensure an acquittal? Maybe she promised them hat lessons. Feels like a mistrial to me. In spite of all these lurid accusations and rumors about Candace and her nephew Melvin, the two of them actually decide to live together for a few years after the trial. Yeah, I guess at that point, what's there to stop them? Shame? They've gone through hell and back to stay together, if you believe they actually had a romance, which I do. Wait, you believe they had a romance? Even after all the photos and evidence that they had a romance? Wow. <laughs> Shocking. Melvin goes back into business and Candace revamps her philanthropy. Now, with unlimited access to the Mossler fortune, she begins throwing lavish fundraisers and parties once again. And sometimes she even calls up her old lawyer, Percy Foreman, to tell him about a tragic story she saw in a newspaper in the hopes that maybe he'll take on the case. But things aren't so sweet at the Mossler mansion. Melvin tells others that he fears he's in danger from Candace. He says, this will come as a shock. She's vindictive and she has a temper. And he is afraid what might happen to him if he finds himself on the receiving end of her revenge. And Candace suspects Mel is cheating on her. And look, folks, we all know what happened to the uh, first man who allegedly cheated on her. In one incident... Candace becomes so angry at Melvin that he has to hide in the bathroom. When she goes to the bathroom, it's locked. Bang, bang, bang. She fires a pistol three times through the door, narrowly missing him and sparing her a second murder trial. Shockingly, the two split up after that. (laughs) I guess again, shocked. Are you shocked? (laughs) Well, all the evidence. I suppose a murder out. I suppose a murder outside the confines of the relationship is one thing, but an attempted murder between the two of them, that can really sour a romance. (laughs) That's the deal breaker for her. And in 1971, Candace finds a new beau to bring home to her mansion. It's a man named Barnett Garrison. He's an electrician and a nightclub owner, several years her junior. Listen, she's got a type, but he's not related to her. Like Melvin, though, Candace and Barnett have really heated fights she suspects him of you guessed it infidelity oh poor candace she just wants to be loved why do men cheat why isn't she enough why is he spending so much time with the go-go dancers at the club he owns you know what some problems just have a way of solving themselves and soon after they marry in 1971 barnett's club mysteriously just burns down hmm i wonder who that could have been Hmm. but then the next year Barnett is found face down in a puddle of his own blood on the patio of the Mossler mansion. Apparently, he fell off the roof, though some suspect he was pushed at the behest of Candace. When asked about the incident, a dazed Candace says, I already shot him, but he was never shot. Awkward. Who did you shoot, Candace? Candace, you've said too much already. Barnett's fall is awful, and it causes him severe brain damage. When he wakes up in the hospital after weeks in a coma, he actually has no memory at all of the fall, or of Candace, or of being married. You know, it seems like over and over again, people in Candace's life are not living up to her expectations of them, and when they don't. Terrible things do seem to happen to them. And that that actually happens even with her kids because she feels like at this point they're not loyal enough. They're not honoring her as a mother. So she decides to cut a few of them out of her will. And that will result in them walking away, leaving Candace once again alone. One of her final acts in the spotlight is a party at her mansion. The band, which has been rocking out, suddenly brings the volume down to a soft drum beat. The lights in the room dim. The crowd's attention is drawn to the staircase where a spotlight beams through cigarette smoke and illuminates this beautiful blonde, older than she looks, Candace Mossler. 
She spends the night talking to a journalist from Esquire, giving him insight into her exploits and her regrets. She's had a few. (laughs) We have our sorrows and our heartaches, she tells him. But you have to put that bridge behind you. Later that year, in October of 1976, Candace is found in her suite at the Fountain Blue Hotel in Miami. She is found dead from an overdose of barbiturates, painkillers, and sedatives. Some of these were administered by her doctor the night before to treat one of her headaches. But at the time they were administered, he didn't know that she had already taken a pharmaceutical cocktail herself. Fewer than 50 people show up at this funeral for her. That seems so low for a socialite that was tied to all these different institutions. I'd imagine more people were probably at that last party she threw. Honoring Candace's last wishes, she's buried next to Jacques Mosler in Arlington National Cemetery in Virginia, the man whom she said she wanted to spend eternity with. So do you think that Jacques is rolling over in his grave? I mean, he's got to be pissed at his new neighbor. Can you imagine spending eternity next to your murderer? I mean... That's where I'm at. I I do yeah. believe she's responsible for his death. This woman, Candace, she just strikes me as somebody that is all id, you know, just all impulses firing, hot and heavy. If she loves you, there's unbridled passion. If she hates you, you're dead. Um, and it, it reminded me of when we did Dorothea Puente in the sense that she's doing everything, not just for survival, but for personal gain. And just like Dorothea, On the outside, you say, here's a woman that's helping people in need, giving to charities, but the money doesn't really belong to her. But she's doing all these things so that she gets status and recognition. And people say, this is a good person. And there's all this sort of benevolent sexism that comes into play. Uh, People say, really? This person? They couldn't have. But at the end of the day, even though everyone's saying they're a good person, nobody showed up at that funeral. You know, in the end, she was really all by herself. But you mentioned her altruism, you know, and I know you're thinking like it did seem to add this air of like that it would just benefit her. But some of it I really do think was more genuine than Dorothea Puente. I have like a more genuine vibe from her altruism, you know, taking four kids in. I mean, yeah, I think her- she was a good, I mean, I think there was periods of time in her life where she was a good mother, right? Totally. Uh, then I think she got even wackier as time totally. went on and toward well, the end, everything really fell apart. Well, I think what's interesting too, and is that she is a woman who used her looks and appearance to attract men. And I think, you know, she lived within this like patriarchal confines And I think as she got older and there were younger women, I think that was something that probably drove her crazy because it was like that was sort of how she functioned in the world, you know, how she got men to buy her things, to be her partner, to do all of this stuff. I mean, listen, if nothing else, she is an enigma wrapped in a fur shawl topped with blonde hair that I do know, which with blood on her hands. 